All right, let's get started. Nice to see you. See you is nice. Welcome to the latest gathering of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, a nonpartisan initiative of the R Street Institute in New America. I'm Kevin Kosar, Vice President of Policy at R Street. So our roadmap for today's gathering is that first I'll introduce our panel and panelists. Uh, then the panelists each will speak. And then we'll open the discussion to you all. I should also note that this session is being videotaped. However, once the pre presentations conclude, we're going to turn off the cameras. That way, you all in the audience can feel comfortable speaking your minds. So today, we are here with members of Convergence's Building a Better Budget Process Project. We have three participants in this lengthy project. And this project, like the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group, is primarily funded by the Hewlett Foundation's Madison Initiative. Now, in December 2015, Convergence began a project to bring new voices into the conversation about reforming the budget process, which, as all of you no doubt know, tends to be dominated by budget wonks and appropriations experts and the like. One of the first steps in developing the project was to begin interviewing stakeholders around D.C. and elsewhere to gain a broad perspective on the budget process. Over the course of 100 interviews with people across the ideological spectrum and varied policy interests, one theme began to emerge. The federal budget process plainly is broken. From the interviewees, Convergence selected stakeholders to bring in a, to a dialogue table. The stakeholders were chosen because they represented a diversity of opinions and viewpoints and brought substantial constituencies with them. And they were willing to put in the time and effort to achieve a successful dialogue process. Again, this is not something that one just does in an afternoon, but it is month after month after month. 24 stakeholders participated in the dialogue phase of the process. There was a wide range of organizations that participated. The groups that were there represented children, engineers, veterans, vulnerable populations, taxpayers, the elderly, and just about everyone in between. The first meeting began with a session allowing each stakeholder to identify where they thought the budget process was broken. With a shared sense of how the process is not working, the stakeholders were then able to move on to developing principles for what a better budget process would look like. At the fourth meeting of the group in February 2017, Stakeholders were given a copy of the U.S. Constitution, told that the government had a budget of more than $4 trillion, and tasked with developing a process entirely from scratch. This exercise gave stakeholders the ability to step away from the current fights over the current policies and to design a whole new process based upon the principles which they had collaboratively developed. The remaining dialogue meetings of the group were dedicated to refining proposals that emerged from the design exercise and considering new concepts raised in the dialogues. As the conversation continued, the group noticed key themes emerging from the debate. Today, you're going to hear about some of those themes and some of those principles. In the end, the stakeholders agreed to five proposals to meet the themes and principles identified. And you'll hear more about those, too, shortly. Uh, speaking as someone who did not participate in the convergence process, I was really, really excited to see how this played out and to see that it played out so successfully. Uh, for one, it's a testament to the folks who participated who had the gumption, goodwill, uh, and energy to think through this, work through this, and come up with something. And I was also heartened because budget is a very, very difficult policy area. It is one um, that so many lances have been broken upon over the years. Everybody agrees there's a problem, but we just can't seem to get it fixed. And what this exercise shows by convergence is that it is possible to bring diverse stakeholders who sit at different places on the table and have them together, and they can work something out. So let's turn to the panel. We're going to start with Lindsay Tarico, Director of Policy and Advocacy at United Way Worldwide. Next, we'll move to Carlos Fuentes, Director of National Legislative Services, Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States. And batting cleanup, Pete Sepp, President of the National Taxpayers Union. I'll turn it over now. Wonderful. 
Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, it warms my heart that so many of you are here to talk about the budget early on a Monday. Um, I know personally I had to shift from the weekend to uh, talk about the budget. Uh, so thank you for being here. So first I want to just start by talking about why United Way is at the table for this conversation. We are probably not the usual suspect in the budget conversation, but uh, really it comes down to the fact that this impacts communities. Uh, when the budget does not uh, operate, uh, function uh, effectively, uh, when uh, we constantly are going from shutdown to shutdown, ultimately it affects people's ability to get the services that they need. Uh, we know that when young children cannot uh, uh, get access to child care, uh, when Head Start child care uh, centers are shut down, or when people uh, who are vulnerable, like children and pregnant women and disabled individuals, cannot get access to their TANF benefits or cannot get access to the WIC program, uh, ultimately uh, that is a lifeline for communities, and when they don't get access to that, it really impacts their ability to thrive and succeed in their communities. And when this happens, the nonprofit sector is the one that has to pick up the slack. Uh, we work closely with uh, government and with business, and so when one of those key sectors in our community does not work effectively, nonprofit organizations, charities uh, have to uh, sort of work uh, in, in uh, uh, overtime to make sure that people get the services that they need. We do not work in a vacuum. We work in partnership with government, and so we have to make up the difference, and we are not equipped to make up the difference when government does not function. So why am I here? It's because we need to be all part of this process, nonprofit organizations, um, as well as government leaders to make sure that uh, everyone in our community has the resources they need to uh, thrive and succeed. So I'm gonna quickly just dig through the principles uh, that we talked about in our discussion. And as I mentioned, because we came from so many different walks of political life uh, and policy like, it was important for us to talk about what are our core principles, what are the things that we are going to uh, really go back to to inform our uh, key proposals. So the first principle that we talked about was that this process needs to be comprehensive. It has to oversee all facets of the government's financial resources, that includes spending and revenues, and it needs to oversee both the short term and the long term. Second, it has to be unbiased. It needs to be neutral. It cannot favor one political party or one administration. It cannot tilt towards one ideology or one specific outcome. Third, it has to be strategic. We have to establish a plan that includes clear and achievable goals for fiscal policy and also guide our, bu our budgetary decision making. Fourth, it has to be transparent. And this is really what spoke to me personally and in my work at United Way. Uh, the House and the Senate are here to serve the American people, so we need to make sure that there's a process that the American people have to understand, and it's a process that they can influence and that they can participate in. And then it has to be informed. It must be informed by data. Uh, we have to have objective, independent, nonpartisan, and high quality data to inform this process. It has to be inclusive, and as you can see from so many different stakeholders at the table, it has to include all different types of people, all different types of entities. Uh, it has to uh, include various viewpoints from the majority, the minority party, um, and various stakeholders. And it has to be durable. It has to stand the test of time across all different administrations, Congresses, Whatever the political environment is, whatever the economic environment is, uh, it has to uh, uh, really be part of uh, the process from, from, from uh, administration and Congress to Congress. 
and it has to be predictable. Uh, it should be uh, a process that everyone knows. You know what the next step is. Uh, it uh, is meaningful and has achievable deadlines. And then finally, it has to be simple. It has to be an easy process that everyone understands um, that's not overly complicated or convoluted. So those were our core principles, as I mentioned, that we really uh, used as we determined what our proposals are. And I'll turn it over to Carlos to talk about what our proposals actually were. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so throughout the process, uh, as you can tell by uh, the number of uh, brilliant individuals that participate in this conversation, uh, we, uh, in a sense, uh, discussed or debated uh, almost every single proposal that has been published, uh, some that were new and, and, and you know, aren't well known, uh, carrots, uh, sticks, you know, bringing back earmarks, and uh, ultimately, what we believed is that um, we need to keep it, as Linda said, simple, uh, realistic, and uh, our goal is for the proposals to be a starting point. Um, for, and as Pete will mention, some of the uh, action that is currently um, occurring. But ultimately, we want it, um, to show, based on our principles, that elections matter um, and review some of the issues that have uh, plagued the system and the process in the past and determine that we need to bring in um, the power brokers and, and, and the, the leadership uh, from the beginning instead of um, going you know, legislating and, and uh, waiting until the next crisis to actually act. Um, that then brings me to the uh, budget action plan, which what we propose is to essentially bring in um, the budget committee, congressional leadership, and the president uh, to set early priorities for uh, each Congress, so the first uh, year of each Congress, uh, it will set a two-year uh, budget caps for discretionary uh, spending, which is typically what has been occurring in the past couple years, even though we have the 10-year BCA caps, you've seen um, bipartisan budget agreements for each two years, um, which will also in require uh, annual um, appropriations. We discussed whether you know it would be best to just do two-year appropriations. Ultimately, we decided that uh, appropriators are going to appropriate, and Congress wants to do its jobs every year, so uh, it would be beneficial to continue that, and for a number of other reasons as well. Um, the budget action plan will also uh, include an analysis of the results. So. Uh, taking a look at enacted appropriations and, and, and budget uh, legislation and seeing what the outcome was each year, right? So comparing uh, enactment to actual, uh, and then the change in the, in the budget ceiling will also be included in the uh, budget action plan because we also wanted this process to be uh, streamlined and non-adversarial as much as we can because uh, we want to take care of, of that issue right away once you're setting the priorities that first year um, instead of waiting and having another issue, another, another battle on, on the um, debt ceiling. Reconciliation is also part of the budget action plan, but we proposed to limit it to uh, once per year. And uh, we all agreed that uh, re the reconciliation process has really gotten away from its intended purpose. So going back to that as much as possible and moving away from uh, you know, passing policy and legislative uh, outcomes through, through uh, reconciliation. The second proposal is the uh, physical state of the nation report. And this is, again, 
going into the, the theme that uh, elections have outcomes and, and consequences. Um, every four years, uh, concurrent with the presidential election, in a time where um, it will essentially uh, be a part of the debate, the presidential debate. So either uh, right when the primaries begin or, or right once the um, parties elect their, their nominees, having a very uh, citizen-based analysis of the state of, of the state of the nation and, and the physical state of the nation, it is easy to digest um, and to understand how uh, the budget impacts everyday life. As Lindsay um, mentioned earlier, uh, we all came to the table because we see the real impact of uh, uh, the budget process in our constituency, right? When you have continuing resolutions, the VFW represents service members, veterans, and their families. When you have uh, budget resolutions that, uh, or continuing resolutions and uh, issues with uh, funding for certain programs, you'll see that uh, service members suffer. You know, you'll have uh, change of duty stations that are canceled. You have training that's canceled uh, during a government shutdown. Uh, veterans, in, in terms of health care, aren't receiving the care they need because of uh, you know, issues in, in terms of receiving the appropriate funding through continued resolution. Um, all those issues uh, are, in a sense, lost in, in, in sometimes in, in our constituency because they don't see how inaction or, or uh, you know, difficulty in Congress enacting uh, stable budgets impact their everyday life and we feel that uh, physical, the physical state of the nation report uh, would be that vehicle to do so. Also, um, reviewing and doing periodic long-term reviews of uh, portfolios in each budget item. Our proposal is to uh, divvy up the budget into certain portfolios and have GAO do periodic reviews to see where uh, these programs are and, and how they compare to projected either revenue or expenditures and, uh, and see, frankly, where, um, where the budget needs to be adjusted. Uh, it would be a staggered review, so we wouldn't have all the portfolios reviewed at the same time, but you'll have at least uh, each portfolio reviewed once every four years. It includes discretionary and, and mandatory um, the side of the ledger. One of the other proposals is to strengthen the budget committee. So again, you know, a lot of proposals have um, discussed whether we, we even need to have a budget committee. We also discussed uh, uh, merging the appropriations committees and the budget committees. Ultimately, we saw that uh, one of the key issues with the current process is that we have a, a process in the very beginning that doesn't really have a huge impact on um, the debates that occur later on when it comes to the appropriations process. And, and that's mainly because you don't have the chair and the ranking members and a lot of the leadership on the budget committee. So our proposal is that the, either the designee or, or preferably the chair or the ranking members of the Ways and Means Committee and the rest of the authorizing committees to sit on the budget committee so that you can have those discussions on policy and, 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 and different proposals uh, in the very beginning instead of waiting until the end, once you're you know, nearing a, a deadline and, and having to, to budget through con concurrent, uh, continuing resolutions. The uh, last component is um, a, a realization that uh, budget support agencies have a significant role in, in the process. 
the Joint uh, Tax Commission and, and, and the um, Congressional Budget Office uh, produce uh, many of the uh, reports and, and material that, that we believe is, is key and, and must be continued, uh, but they also need that support to be able to produce reliable, uh, unbiased data that we can uh, base uh, a lot of these key decisions on. So our proposal is to strengthen these support agencies. Um, and, and hopefully with all of these proposals, our, our goal is to um, have a streamlined uh, budget process that will uh, lead to, to better outcomes. And um, I'll turn it over to Pete who will discuss uh, the way forward. Many thanks. The future. Well, let's see if we can narrow that down a bit. The Joint Select Committee on uh, the Budget and Appropriations process probably conjures up the image of 2011, the so-called Super Committee that tried to solve all of our deficit problems and people are saying, oh gosh, not another one of these. Here's why I think that this process will afford the convergence proposals, an opportunity to be heard and perhaps embraced, as well as increase the chances for success of budget process reform. Look, the fact is, the Joint Select Committee process, even on its own, only guarantees a small chance of success for budget process reform. I can tell you this, though, without the Joint Select Committee process, our chances for reform go from small to virtually nil. Here's why the design of this committee is sort of taking a nod to past history, picking up on the mistakes that were made in past committee models, and is increasing the chance that we just might get a good set of proposals through. Turn back the clock to just after World War II. Uh, there had been proposals to establish a congressional budget resolution going all the way back to the Taft administration, and they were mainly commission-style recommendations, but right after World War II, Congress tried to get serious about it. They created what was called the Joint Committee on the Legislative Budget. And what they did was staff this Joint Committee with 102 members of Congress all the tax writers, all the appropriations writers, all at once, trying to reach consensus over a budget resolution. What do you think the outcome of that was? Well, there was actually an editorial at the time uh, that uh, commented, looking back on its first three years of operation, 40, uh, 47, 48, and 49, and they said, well, in uh, the first year, they failed to reach agreement on a resolution. In the second year, they reached agreement on a resolution and failed to abide by it. And in the third year, they just gave up trying. Lesson one, the committee was too large. Then, of course, we met with success in 1972. Uh, many people believe that uh, the Budget Impoundment and Control Act uh, was a visceral response from a Democratic Congress to a Republican president's overextension of his or her, uh, of his budget powers, and that wasn't actually the case. This process also began with a joint select committee. This one was called the Joint Study Committee on Budget Control, hashed out a whole set of prescriptions for Congress to establish a more orderly appropriations process. Those recommendations later became part of the law that passed in 1974, and it passed unanimously in the Senate, passed with only six votes in opposition in the House. So that was not a partisan exercise, another lesson learned. The Joint Study Committee was more focused, more serious, and less partisan in nature than the ones established in the 1940s and prior. 1993, of course, provided a counter lesson. Uh, here we had a Joint Select Committee on the Reorganization of Congress, 
broke down primarily because House Democrats wanted to do away with the Senate's filibuster process. There were interchamber, interchamber rivalries, not just inter-party rivalries. Another lesson to be learned, you have to have bicameral and cross-cameral communications, not just bipartisan communications. Now we fast forward to 2011. Again, people are comparing what we have now, the Joint Select Committee that's meeting with the Super Committee. Totally different objectives here. The Super Committee sought outcomes, specific reductions in deficits or levels of taxation or increases in levels of taxation. That is not the purpose of the Joint Select Committee, obviously. And this is how it parallels with the Convergence Project, building a better budget process. We all had to set aside our preconceived notions of the outcomes we wanted from the budget process. Rather, we just wanted a process that could function. Uh, from my standpoint, a fiscally conservative policy group, uh, we think the budget process is flawed because it represents deferred decision making. The results are shallow, scattered oversight, uh, no action on structural problems and entitlement programs, and that thing called a 20 odd trillion dollar national debt. I mean, that's all a consequence of deferred decision making. But that's not why I'm endorsing this and National Taxpayers Union is endorsing these reforms. It's because we need a process that functions again, not necessarily a process that leads to a certain level of taxes or spending. The way this Joint Select Committee is structured is very encouraging on a number of levels. You see some of the details up there, but that doesn't quite do it justice. There's a November 30th deadline for this committee consisting of 16 members, equal number of Republicans and Democrats, equal number of lawmakers from the chambers. But this is not a report that will easily gather dust on a shelf. Once the committee ends up releasing its recommendations, could even be before November 30th, the majority leader of the Senate has to transmit those recommendations to the Senate Budget Committee. The Senate Budget Committee must act to report out the recommendations as legislation without amendment within seven days of receiving them. Otherwise, it gets discharged onto the floor of the Senate. Once it gets discharged or sent to the floor of the Senate, you have 10 hours of debate maximum on the motion to proceed. No filibustering is possible there. Now, the Senate may decide to filibuster the final bill, but again, there's no way to defer a decision on this resolution, at least not an easy one. The important thing here, I think, is to recognize that this is not only an opportunity to reform the process, it's also an opportunity to show the American people that this institution can work, and that's going to reflect on all of you very well politically. Uh, we have been visiting uh, almost all of the offices, I, in fact, we have visited every single one all 16 offices associated with the Joint Select Committee. We've also met with uh, Speaker Ryan's budget staff, uh, Minority Leader Schumer's staff. Um, from those two, we got especially positive reactions about not only our proposals, but our willingness in such a large coalition of organizations to engage on budget process reform. I think that that will work to your political benefit, not because uh, of some fantasy scenario <laughs> that we would create here. It, it, it's not as if you're going to have folks with pitchforks and signs coming to your office saying, what do we want? Portfolio-based performance reviews of federal programs. When do we want it? Now. No, that's not what it is. But there is an underlying public skepticism about the workability of the budget process itself. In 
2011, just before the shutdown wars and uh, the super committee was formed, uh, there was a poll taken uh, by the Washington Post and Pew Research, and uh, they found, uh, interestingly, that um, about 69% of those surveyed had virtually nothing but negative impressions of the budget process as it stood then. And uh, the respondents were asked to come up with one word that would describe how they felt about the process. Topping the list, and I'll go down the list quickly. Ridiculous, disgusting, frustrating, messy, disappointing, stupid, bull, I will not complete the rest of the word, poor, terrible, childish, fair, number 11, the 11th <laughs> biggest response, the, your first positive word there of fair. And then behind it, horrible, idiotic, stinks, chaotic, confusing, pathetic, political, slow, and sucks. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? <laughs> now fast forward to this year when Gallup took a poll. Uh, not on the budget process, but I think it reflects why the political opportunity is really good here for budget process reform. Democrats and Republicans who were self-identified in the survey were asked to rank sort of the top U.S. problems in their opinion uh, facing the country today. And the lists between Republicans and Democrats uh, have very, very little overlap, almost none. Uh, the economy is there, uh, education, but out of all of these topics, there's really only one that uh, resonates with both parties. Uh, topping the list among Democrats, the biggest problem, government dissatisfaction. Where was that on the list for Republicans? Uh, close second. So if you're looking for one issue in common between the parties, it's general dissatisfaction with the way government works. This is the way to get government working again. It's not necessarily going to happen overnight. And many of the ideas, of course, that uh, the Joint Select Committee could come up with could vary from the ones that we're presenting here. But that's sort of the way it's supposed to work. The point is, if we establish a more stable budgeting environment, lots of other things can fall into place. The very process of making other types of policy not related to the budget can once again find bipartisan safe space in which to be made. You'll also have, as the bullet point up there says, more time for legislating and oversight. I mean, this portfolio-based oversight proposal we have is long overdue. It's got major support on both sides of the aisle, that would be a great starting point. We'll also have the time to develop more quality information about budgetary proposals themselves. One of our big proposals was enhance and strengthen budget information organizations. Well, you need not only more money for that, you need more time for that. And this could give us the space to do it. I'll simply conclude by saying there's a vital need not only to develop budget process reform proposals, and I'm hopeful that the Joint Select Committee will be the vehicle to carry them, but there's also a job for everyone in this room to do if it actually does happen. Uh, I'll quote from the uh, uh, Congressman Richard Bowling of uh, Missouri. He was uh, head of the Rules Committee at the time they re reformed the budget process in 1974. He said, to make this design work is going to be just as onerous, perhaps more onerous and more difficult than coming up with the design in the first place. That is where all of us are going to have to come in. Whatever the committee can recommend, whatever can make it past congressional votes, Hopefully by the end of this year, if not this year, then we'll reintroduce it next year. Whatever it is, we're all going to have to work very hard to focus on process rather than outcomes and work across the aisle. We did it, you can too, and if we haven't come to visit you yet, get ready.
It'll be a pleasure to talk with all of you uh, after the session and follow up. So thank you. All right, well thank you to our panelists. I um, just wanna tag on to something Pete mentioned at the very end, which is that if we can get our budget process straightened out or just modestly improved, I think it's gonna open up a lot more space for legislating in the kind of old-fashioned deliberative across the aisle way because right now it's so hard to get anything done and the budget process gobbles up so much time and now the budget process has basically become a vehicle for legislating. So we all know what the omnibuses look like. They're jam full of stuff. We don't know, you know, half the time, you don't know what's in there. These mega bills uh, are making policy and often the policy is not exactly well vetted. Uh, it's dropped in and members are then given the really rotten uh, choice of either trying to scuttle the whole darn package or swallowing uh, what's in the bill. And that's certainly not ideal and the public certainly doesn't like seeing omnibuses, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 page bills. They, they want bills read, they want policy to be made in a cognizable manner. Uh, anyway, moving on, uh, let's turn it over. Uh, open it up to the floor. Do folks have questions about what was said, the process, the proposal, anything on budget? 